to talk about something that is both really, really important and really inspiring, and that is innovative treatments in cancer care. Now, cancer will touch four out of ten people directly in this country will suffer from cancer. One in two men, one in three women. And because of that, it affects all of us in our families. And, you know, this is a devastating set of diseases. Now, what's the inspiring part? Is the ingenuity and intelligence of human beings have tackled this task, and the amount of science and innovation is phenomenal right now. And we are making huge strides in tackling these devastating diseases. And what I want to take you through today are a few pieces about how we do that. Now, before we do that, we are in the U.S., even if we're in the Pacific, and thus I must give you this disclaimer. I am representing my views. I'm not a healthcare professional. I'm a molecular biologist, and I've worked in the pharmaceutical industry for 26 years. And you have my bio. I have worked in over 90 countries in everything from self-care and vaccines up through oncology and stem cell transplant. So I am representing this point of view. I always encourage you to be well-informed and to understand your disease and talk to your healthcare professional. Okay, that is really fundamentally important. The other thing is I'm going to give you examples here today that are designed to help you be better informed, ask better questions, know where to go. They are not comprehensive, okay? So please take that in mind. And before I get into the details, I do want to congratulate and acknowledge that you are taking steps on one of the things that's most important to us, which is health. And really being well-informed is a critical element of being a strong advocate for you as a patient. So, what will I cover? A little bit of brief background on cancer, so we're all in the same place as to what it is and what are some of the important foundations. Then the types of treatments, and I'm going to focus on the innovative types of treatments, really targeted therapy, also you hear the term precision medicine or personalized medicine, immuno-oncology, which is exploding right now in terms of science, and then also a really exciting element of cellular therapy which I had the personal privilege to launch recently last year. And that is truly personal therapy. So not just precision, but personal, your treatment. Okay? Then we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. Okay? So what is cancer itself? Cancer is fundamentally the multiplication of cells in an uncontrolled manner. So the balance between growth and cell death gets out of whack. And all of our cells grow and replicate, but in this case, they don't die. And what happens with cancer that's different from other benign tumors is it can invade other tissues, and you have mutations that often drive it. Now, the thing to think about, and I'll talk about causes of cancer on the next slide, but when you hear about the genes that cause cancer, the oncogenes, really what this is is our DNA replicates all the time, but it's like making a cut and paste on a paper. You cut part of it, you copy it, and then when you paste it again, you've now got a typo in it. And that's what happens in the DNA. And most of the time, our body is able to see that and not have it become an issue. But occasionally, it escapes. And that's what happens with genetic drivers of cancer. Now, what are the key drivers? Genetics, okay, your DNA, how it re reproduces itself, has an error, and this leads to some of the areas I'll talk about of what happens, cancer grows, and it grows in an uncontrolled manner. Another key driver is hormones. So hormones are obviously wonderful things, lead to us being of our genders, all sorts of experiences, but they're actually a key driver of cancer, and the difference between male and female cancers is hormonally driven. If you took out breast cancer, prostate cancer, et cetera, and you lined up the types of cancer, it looks very similar between the two genders. But prostate cancer for men, breast cancer for women, ovarian cancer, these are driven predominantly by hormones. Now, the environment can lead to cancer as well, because it causes damage to the DNA when it's replicating, and that leads to that typo and that error. 
You also have certain physiological circumstances, particularly obesity, et cetera, that also can trigger and lead to cancer. And then, of course, there's been a lot of work over the last 20 years or so, and my mother as a virologist knows this, where viruses actually integrate into the DNA and, again, cause these errors. Now, the reality is some of these things come together in some patients. You have hormones as well as genetics, or you have hormones as well as the environment, and that leads to cancers in this case. So good news, bad news, we understand it. Bad news is we can't really control some of these things. But if we can identify it early, we can do the right monitoring and make sure that patients are identified early in stage of disease. And that leads to this slide, which talks about stages of disease. Now, I've already said that cancer is over 200 types of diseases. So each type of cancer has a specific staging of the disease. At the same time, you'll hear these four areas. Do I have stage three, stage four, et cetera? What this basically means is early stage disease is what you'd expect. It's small, it hasn't spread. When it talks about localized, it's small, it's spread a little bit, maybe into a lymph node. Okay, so the lymph system is part of the body that helps move the cells that fight infection, cancer, et cetera, around. And so it is a good detection system if the disease is spread. And then third stage has more tissue around and you have involvement at a distant lymph node. So if you have breast cancer, there are nodes right here in your underarm axilla. And in that case, that would be localized. But if it's up here in my neck, now we're talking about regional. Okay, and then the most advanced type is stage four, and that's where the disease has metastasized. And that's a term which means that you have the primary lesion, okay, or tumor here in the breast, but now you see disease in the liver or in the lung. And that's the most advanced stages. Now, so why is that important? It's important because you need to understand that for your prognosis. What are the options that you have? and what type of workup, meaning what sort of test, what sort of biopsy, what sort of evaluations are they going to do in order to understand the disease and what steps they need to take next. And that leads to your treatment choice. So understanding the stage of your disease is important, as is what's called grade, which means how different the cancer looks. So remember that cancer cells are all normal cells at the beginning, but they grow in different ways. And if they look more different, that means they're out of the control of the body more. And that's usually an indication that it's more aggressive disease. Okay? So understanding your stage is important to have the right conversation with your healthcare professional. Now, so we've made tremendous progress, tremendous progress in this disease, but there are still some really scary numbers. 1.6 Americans will be diagnosed this year. Unfortunately, 600,000 of the people will pass away this year of cancer. So we have a long way to go. Now, what is encouraging is since the peak, which was in the early 90s, of the mortality of cancer, is we have reduced the mortality rates down 23%. Okay, so this has led to 2.5 million people in America being alive that would not have been alive otherwise. So that's, I always try to bring it back to the individual. Because one of the calls we had at my company is that every patient matters and every day matters. Okay, so you're trying to make a difference for that patient right now. Because that allows them to make memories, have moments for themselves and their families. Now, this reduction has largely come actually from treatment interventions. So the drugs, the surgery, the other things I'll touch on to help them in that setting. Now, I mentioned earlier, this is an absolutely incredible time scientifically. We know more about what causes cancer than we ever have. And, you know, this number of 40% of research and development spend is focused on cancer. To give you context, only 3% of physicians are oncologists or hematologists. So you have 40% of billions and billions and billions of dollars going against this disease. And we know it better than we ever have. Now, 
Contextually, there are 900 programs in clinical development and 4,000 different trials. So this is incredible. It's also a challenge for your physician, right? Which is one reason why it's important to be informed because it's impossible for any individual human to know all of that, okay? So they have resources, you have resources, and together, how do you make the best decisions for yourself? Now, the other thing that's happening is you've probably heard the terms artificial intelligence, machine learning, okay? And what this allows us to do is take platforms like IBM Watson, uh, which, of course, people know for winning Jeopardy, but that was actually just a PR stunt to show how, how smart this thing was. It has read all of the medical literature. It will pass medical school this year. Okay? And so when you think about the power of knowing about all these 4,000 different trials, knowing about the 40 million pages of literature that are out there, and using that tool to help a physician make informed decisions, it's really exciting because we have the science and we're gonna have the technology to really fight this the best way we can. Now, why has this progress happened? Well, it started, of course, many, many years ago in individual physicians and scientists, but it was catalyzed by the war on cancer in 1971. And so you had the establishment of the National Cancer Act and the NCI creation with Andrew von Eschenbach, who I sit on several boards with, uh, who started the National Cancer Institute. And then you had Mary Lasker and Albert Lasker, who were incredible advocates and drove a lot of funding and a lot of energy behind this. And this led to a massive investment in infrastructure and research that has led to this data and technology. Now, the other piece that's really important is societally, we've reduced the stigma on cancer. So people can be more open, people can uh, embrace it early and attack it early together. The other piece that is fundamental, and I'm going to talk about this at the end of my talk, which is the brave patients and their families who participate in clinical research. The healthcare professionals are dedicated to this, the scientists at companies like mine are dedicated to this, but without the patients and their families, we will not make the advances that we can. So this is why we've led to this wonderful progress. Now, we've made huge strides, as I've described, scientifically, diagnostically, societally, and in treatment, but we have a long way to go. And part of this is not just about what we treat with, but how the patients receive care in our system. And this needs to be integrated across different physicians, it needs to be integrated across different treatment modalities, and we also have to change the way trials are conducted because it's very inefficient, it takes too long, and we have too many questions to answer. So I'll speak on that in a little bit. And then we need to make sure we continue to prove access to care. The United States, and I've worked in over 90 countries, has both the best and the worst care in the world. And a lot of it depends on where you live and who you get to see. And that's not really acceptable. So we need to work and continue to make sure people have access. So, now let's get to the meat of the innovative treatments. So on the left-hand side, this shows the concept of targeted therapies, then immuno-oncology, and then cellular therapy. So let me start with targeted therapies and how they work as a platform, as a new pillar. So sometimes your physicians will talk about pillars of medicine. And what you have, of course, here is prevention. So an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure is very real. Okay, and the earlier we can detect and the earlier we can understand, the better we can get ahead of this because if it's small and localized, the outcomes are great. Okay, 99% survival in prostate cancer if you find it early. Okay, that's, that's what you're really looking for, okay? And we're blessed that my mother, my mother-in-law, many of her friends are breast cancer survivors because we found it in an earlier stage, right? Now, surgery is a key element to remove the tumor, get that disease out, all right? Radiation, attack the tumor with radio, uh, radiation where you can't do the surgery or you choose not to. And then, of course, what many of you know of chemotherapy, right? Now, chemotherapy is basically a poison. It is designed to kill the cell, all right? Now, unfortunately, it's not very specific so it kills other fast-growing cells, hair, 
stomach lining, these types of things. That's why you have the side effects that you see with most chemotherapies. And those were the pillars that we had for decades. But about 15 years ago, my old company ushered in the era of targeted therapies. And I'll take you through that journey just a little bit. Now, how do therapies generally work? First, you may block a key gene. So this gene causes the replication and growth of the cells. So if you block it, the cells don't grow. You may, as I said with chemotherapy, just poison or kill the cell directly. There's a chemical that causes the cell to die. Additionally, you may stop signals that cause it to grow. Tumors are incredibly smart. They will hijack the cell's mechanics and make it grow. So they'll produce more of the hormones or more of the cell signals that say grow, grow, grow. And that's also why people feel tired or they have wasting is because the cancer is taking all the energy and things that normally apply to the rest of your body and they're focusing it on their cells. All right? So you can stop those growth signals. You can literally trigger the signals in the cell that are, cause it to die. So our, our cells have little programs that say, okay, when these things come, it's time to go away, and you can start and cause that. That's what's called apoptosis, and you may have heard that term sometimes. Bless you. The other piece is starve them of their fuel. So prostate, breast, ovarian, these are driven by your hormones. So if you can block that fuel, then they don't grow. All right? And then the last one, and this is a very exciting area, is you actually change the environment around the cells. So the tumor cells not only hijack to say, grow more of me, they actually cloud the environment. They protect themselves from the immune system by basically creating a cloaking device and, and clouds and say, I'm not here, don't recognize me, don't attack me. So we're now able to change that environment and clear those clouds out so your cells that normally fight these, these things can go in and attack the cancer. So these are the, th the ways the therapies work. Now, targeted therapies specifically and chemotherapies had this traditional development program. And don't worry, this is not on the graduation test, okay, <laughs> this piece. But what I want to show you with this slide is the complexity of drug development is huge, okay? We have to start way back here with find the target, do all sorts of fancy stuff I don't understand, okay? Lots of tests, lots of evaluations, and it's very complex, costs billions of dollars to get a product to market, and then you do what's called phase one, phase two, phase three testing. Now, this is usually you're trying to find out if the drug is safe, okay? What we know now with the science is we know that there is a mechanism and an activity, and we know that that has an action. So if we can actually test it and get it in the right place, we know it's gonna have that activity but is it safe, okay? So that's what this testing phase does. This phase two is now looking and saying, okay, let's evaluate the activity. Does it really have the clinical activity? And then phase three is saying, we're gonna confirm that activity on a large scale, so we know it's real. This has now changed, and it's changed because the science is so much better. So we can go faster. So now what we basically do is we do discovery, evaluate, does this make sense, is there a logic scientifically, et cetera. We explore that mechanism in patients and in other models, and then we do a quick confirmatory trial, which means, yes, this works. The last piece then is now, because these are usually very scientifically sound ideas, they actually often apply across multiple diseases. So now we expand it. So instead of just testing it and say, chronic myelogenous leukemia, we know that can work in GIST. We know that can work in ALL. We know that can work in another disease. So we then expand the use very rapidly in order to bring these therapies forward to patients. Now, we, we have to do all of these things too, because that's regulated. So what you should know is that the FDA in the United States and EMEA in Europe have very stringent criteria that we have to deliver against and so all these things have to be done, but we can go faster to this point, which allows us to bring it to more patients than we ever could before. So what do you want to consider when you're thinking about, is this treatment right for me, and what do I understand? So first and foremost, 
what is the way it works? Doctor, how does this attack my disease? To understand that. Next piece is, what's the level of evidence we have right now? Sometimes we have a lot of data, sometimes we don't have a lot of data yet. And understanding that can be important for your choice. Next piece is, what happens when the treatment fails if it does or resistance develops? Because remember, cancer is a very smart animal, and it is trying to escape. It's trying to get away from whatever you're doing to it. And sometimes, unfortunately, our products don't work well enough or long enough for the patients. So what happens next is an important question. All right? Then, what are the side effects? What is this going to have on my quality of life? You know, am I going to have you know, hair loss? Am I going to have diarrhea? Am I going to have you know, autoimmune? What, what does that mean? Okay, and how do I feel about that? And then, what are the costs, depending on your insurance, depending on your access, how does that work? And then, hassle. What do I mean by hassle? How often do I have to go? Where do I have to go? You know, how much monitoring is going on, etc. These are all equations that you have to put in to understand. Now, the other thing that is sad is many, many people do not take advantage of the resources that are available. Okay? There are tremendous educational resources offered by American Cancer Society, they're offered by the companies, they're offered by patient advocacy groups for the diseases, and that includes information about the disease, information about the treatments, also information about access and payment and support financially. So please make sure that you take advantage of the information that's out there. Now, I always recommend going to the, I'll say, the most robust sources, which again are American Cancer Society, good advocacy groups and the companies themselves because they have to be reviewed and approved and agreed in order to communicate those things out, okay? So, targeted therapies, what happens? On the left-hand side, this is designed to represent a specific genetic mutation that the scientists understand causes the disease. So in the case of CML, which is chronic myeloid leukemia, which is the disease that was the first targeted uh, treatment was approved for, Gleevec in Matinib, that's BCR able. We see in chromosome 9, you see this translocation, you know that's going to lead to bad things, and you can block that. All right? So you identify the target, then you have to design the drug that fits into that binding site, that blocks that activity, and that requires a lot of chemistry and a lot of sophistication, but we can do it more and more. So you basically think of a lock and a key. The lock is where the mutation is. The key is in there to block it, okay? And so once you do that, then what do you want to do as a patient? You want to ideally treat only the patients who have that mutation with that drug. So we say find the right patient, right product, right time, okay? Now, what should your physicians understand and what should you understand? Is there a genetic test? For some diseases, there is. For other diseases, they're not. So understand if it's there. Conduct it, get the results, and then what are the considerations the physicians will be thinking about? Is there enough tissue? And I'll use an example in lung cancer in a minute, because when you do the biopsy or you remove the tumor, you're trying to see do you have enough tissue to conduct this test or not. Is it reimbursed? Some of your physicians or your insurance companies will not reimburse certain tests or they make it hard, in which case you may need to advocate for that if it's appropriate, okay? Sometimes it takes three weeks to get the results back. Do you have a disease that you need to act faster than that? Okay, so sometimes you get the test, but you go ahead and take a treatment. And then, what are the results, and is there a drug, or is there a trial that is appropriate for that test, okay? So now, this is a little complicated, but I'm going to walk you through it left to right, because this is how trials were conducted on the left and how they're conducted more and more now on the right. So what you want to do is identify the patient with that specific target and only treat them. Okay? Previously, what we had, and pay attention to the different colors of the people, because you see they're all mixed up here. So we would take a lung cancer trial, and we would say we have a... EGFR mutation, let's test it in lung cancer. We know EGFR is active in, in that cancer. But unfortunately, what would happen is we'd treat this, and these green 
people would get the benefit because they were EGFR positive, right? But these people, the light blue, would get no benefit because they weren't. And in fact, some people would have side effects. So these two groups got nothing good out of that process. And in fact, we might not even get the drug approved because the activity wasn't good enough in the whole population to say, let's bring it forward. So then what we moved to is we were able to stratify the patients into their groups and say, this is the group that we're going to test this particular drug on because we know they have the mutation. And that's called precision medicine. And that allows us now to know that each patient is going to benefit from the specific treatment based on their disease. So this has made huge strides, both in terms of how fast we can take a product from the lab to the patient, but also we're able to spare patients who otherwise wouldn't benefit. And this is really, really important. So that's what targeted therapy allows you to do. And it has transformed the treatment of cancer. So this is um, chronic myeloid leukemia and Gleevec, the product that I've spoken about. And this is something that's called the Kaplan-Meier curve, and you will hear about it with oncologists. And the bottom is always time, and the left-hand side is often what they call progression-free survival, which means you are not progressing on your disease. Okay? You'll also see this for survival in general. And what you want to be is at the top. A curve that looks like this means these patients are not progressing on their treatment and not progressing with their disease. This line is what CML treatment used to look like. And you can see these patients are progressing fairly steadily. Now, nine out of 10 patients will die of something besides leukemia. Okay, so it totally transformed the way care is given. And Novartis was recognized at the Pregalian Awards, which is, in essence, the equivalent of the Nobel Sciences for the Life Sciences Agreement. And I had the privilege, the personal privilege, of accepting that award on behalf of the company. And it will always be in my heart to have had that opportunity. Because the folks who make this decision, seven of them are Nobel laureates. So this is very serious science, very serious recognition of how this changed the treatment of cancer. And the best news of this is it didn't stop at leukemia. There are many drugs targeting many different mutations, treating many different diseases. And so this is huge progress and really exploded into a new treatment paradigm. So why does it matter and how does it play out in real treatment? This is a complicated slide, but let me walk you through it. Because basically, this is a testing on lung cancer, where in lung cancer, there are at least six mutations we know of that have an effect on the disease and can be treated with a specific drug. So it would make sense that you want to test the patient and understand what their disease looks like to decide the treatment, right? What does this data show you? This data shows you that only two-thirds of the patients are actually tested for one of those mutations. And less than 10% are tested for all of them. All right? And many of them are not tested. So, next, how does that turn into treatment? Now, remember, this is the curve I just showed you with survival and time. This blue line is the targeted treatment. So, if you had a mutation and you got a targeted treatment, you had a better or a higher response. If you didn't, this green is not good. So what I've highlighted down here at the bottom is that if every patient had been tested and they'd received the appropriate treatment, 12% of the patients would have survived more than two years, longer than they did. It's important, okay, and it's available. So. This then turns to clinical trials. How do we conduct these? I showed you before how we used to do the trials with all patients. Now, there are a couple ways we can do this differently. So we do the test on the mutation, EGFR, ROS, ALK1, all those fun acronyms I showed you before. Okay? And then what we do is we go to wherever that patient is, whatever that disease is. So it doesn't matter if it's lung cancer, brain cancer, etc. If they've got that mutation, we can test against it to see if it has an effect. And this allows the trials to be conducted in many more places, thus more patients have access, and it's faster. 
Okay? The other term that you may hear out there are basket trials. And these are designed in major cancer centers to, again, do the testing and then take the patients who have that particular mutation to a specific treatment and trial. So these are really important steps to be more effective and better for the patients in terms of how we conduct the trials. So it's a very exciting time that way. Now, what should you do about this or your loved ones? Explore and ask, is there a genetic test for my particular disease? Okay, or should I have it anyway? Because sometimes if it's an unusual or rare cancer, there may be a mutation that is relevant and you could again test. Now, some of these are what we call actionable. We know there's a t test, we know there's a drug, and you should get that and then get the activity. Others are still under investigation. We don't fully understand what the connection is. And then, as a patient, understand the trade-offs for getting the test. And I'll explain this a little bit when I talk about immuno-oncology. Should you wait for the treatment? What's the right sequence of the treatment? How should you approach that? Okay. Now, immuno-oncology, very exciting platform. And what this basically is, is harnessing your immune system, which has done an amazing job day in and day out, fighting disease, fighting pathogens, fighting cancer, in order to allow you to get to the ripe old ages that we are, Okay, because every day it's under attack. It's harnessing that and saying, okay, we're going to make sure you can work even better. And historically in cancer, we've seen these remissions or these responses in melanoma and renal cell in particular, where all of a sudden a patient had very advanced disease, we didn't have a treatment, and then they're cured. And we're cured because something happened in the immune system that allowed it to work again and get rid of that disease. So there's always been this promise that if we could unlock that and guide that, it could be probably the most powerful treatments we have. And that promise has come to reality. And I used to work 25 years ago on interleukins, interferons, et cetera, and we were trying to make this work and it just was partially there. But now it's really there and that's what's really exciting. So what happens is, you know, as I said, the immune system's really effective at this, and I talked earlier about the fact that the tumors fool the body. They create this cloud. They say, I'm not, I'm not bad, don't attack me. You know, leave me alone, et cetera. And they do this in a number of ways. And so the treatment is designed to educate the system or get rid of that cloud. So again, the body's cells can attack this. The other step, is to stimulate the immune system or to turn it up, make it more active so it's continuing to fight the disease. So these are the ways that immuno-oncology works. In cytokines, which is up here at the top, these are proteins that your body uses every day. It makes them. You'll hear interleukin 1, 2, all the way up through 20s, okay, and interferons. The problem is, is these are kind of broad brush things. When you have the flu, your body is producing a lot of interferon, okay? And so you don't actually feel bad because of the virus, you feel bad because of the reaction your body has created to the virus. And so it's broad and it works part of the time, but it's difficult side effects and it's not very specific. What we have now is the first generation of what they call checkpoint inhibitors. PD-1, PD-L1, and you may have seen advertisements on TV for Optivo or Keytruda. And these are these products. And I'll explain on the next slide how they really work. Um, because what they allow you to do is activate the immune system and clear up the disease. So let me orient you here. So this is the tumor cell on the top left. This is the T cell, part of your immune system that is attacking. And what happens is there's this area called program death one. And you see here, the T cell comes in, binds, and what that does is the tumor cell turns off the immune system. It says, don't attack me, I'm good, I'm safe, I'm normal, okay? But what happens here is they come in and they break up this binding right here, and now the T cell sees the tumor cell for what it is. And you can block it here, and that's what the PD-1s do on the, on the T cell, or you can block it here on the tumor cell, and in that case, now the cell is killed. But the T cell does its job, sees it, oh, you're bad, I kill you. And so that's why these therapies have come out 
and they've really done a wonderful job for many patients. But what are the considerations on this? So far, what we've seen is that a moderate percentage of patients, can be between 20 and 50 percent, will get a very long-term response from this because the immune system now sees the cancer, recognizes it, can fight it on an ongoing basis. There are other patients, unfortunately, where that's not enough. Either the immune system is not in the state where it can fight properly because of other things, or the disease is more clever and has other ways to get around it. So we still have a long way to go on this because also the responses to this are difficult for the physicians to measure. And so it's tremendously exciting, it's early. And we know there's a lot more we can do in this area. And so that's why at the bottom here, you'll see it speak about combinations and patient selection. So what do I mean by this? If, if you're familiar with the term biomarkers, this is a signal, just like I talked about in targeted therapy, that says this patient has this mutation, okay, and this level of it, you measure it in numbers. And the more of it you have, the more likely you are to respond. The less of it that you have, the less likely that that particular treatment is going to respond for you. So this has been something that has evolved and will continue to evolve. And we, we when we sit in our research committees, we're talking a lot about, do we start with this one, add this one, do we prime with this one, or give them together. And you have to think through both the science and the side effects of that, okay? So these are the choices that we have ahead of us. But the great news is, is there are over 2,500 trials looking at these questions. And so we're going to continue to inform ourselves better and better about what is the appropriate way. Now that is stimulating your immune system. Cellular therapy, as I said earlier, is truly personal therapy. So what this is, and this has existed for years in what you call here about stem cell transplant. And you see the term aloe and auto. So aloe is yourself, take your cells. Auto is take a relation or somebody who matches you and infuse them into the patient. So this is a technology that's existed for decades. But what's different now are these two products have been recently approved. And I and my team got Kim Raya approved last summer. And I'll tell you the story about that in a minute. And these are truly personal therapies. So what happens? So you take the patient and you take out a portion of their blood. You then screen for just the T cells. You then grow those T cells out you then engineer them with something that targets the cancer in the body. You purify them, and then you give them back to the patient. So what you are doing is going in and engineering your immune system to specifically attack that cancer. And because they're your cells, the body will not reject them or fight them, and it goes in and kills the cancer. Now... This sounds very science fiction. It's real. And in my book that I use, I keep all my numbers, all my information in, at the back of it, I have two pictures. I have Nora, who passed away, who did not get the treatment. And I have Emily. Emily was patient number one, and she was three hours from death, according to Dr. Grupp. She got the infusion. She's now six years out cancer-free. And to put this in context, these are patients who have failed chemotherapy, failed targeted therapy, failed transplantation, and we have an 83% response rate for these patients. So this is incredible, and again, a personal privilege to be part of, but it's also just the beginning because we have a lot to learn about how to give these therapies and how to make it easier and faster and more accessible. So these are in incredible advances that we're going to see not only just this, 
but combine that with a targeted therapy for a specific disease, or combine that with immuno-oncology for a specific need at a specific time. So the potential is huge. So I tried to think about, you know, how do you make these choices, and what would you consider? And so is targeted therapy going to be right? Is immuno-oncology going to be right? And this is a, something that physicians and patients grapple with. So what would you decide? The short answer is, unfortunately, it depends. It depends on where your data and evidence are for your disease, your goals, understanding what we know about the best order of treatment. It might be best to start with a targeted therapy, take the disease burden down, and then come in with immuno-oncology. It could also be better to do immuno-oncology first and then attack the remaining disease. That's what the scientists are continuing to work through. And then, of course, what are the side effects or quality of life for where I am as a patient and what it means to me. Now, I'm going to speak about two last subjects and then we'll open it up for questions and theoretical answers. Okay. Which, okay. All right. So, cost in clinical trials. Now, cost is a huge concern in the United States healthcare system. And, you know, I again have worked in over 90 countries, and I will tell you again, we have the best and the worst system. All right? Now, part of that is because we spend 18% of our gross national product on healthcare. On average, around the world, they spend about eight. And that's in the developed worlds. It can be down to 4% or less in other countries. We're incredibly fragmented. We have many different systems and groups, and it harms us as a society. So we have to do things differently to have a better sustainable approach. But let's talk about drugs specifically. So I tried to convey to you the complexity of doing the drug discovery and the science. This requires huge resources, huge amounts of work, and then we're highly regulated. And most of that fails. In fact, only 6% of the candidates that reach human testing make it into the market and are accessible drugs for patients in that way. So it's a very big failure rate. So high innovation, high cost, high risk, high reward is the model that's set up in this environment. Now, uh, there are actually over 1,500 companies that are tackling this, and more than 1,200 of those will fail. The companies will fail not just the products, okay? So it's a huge cost to bring products to market because all those regulatory steps, all those testing steps can cost millions to hundreds of millions of dollars. And now the other piece that is distinct for the United States is these innovations become your generic products because the products have what's called a life exclusivity. So for a certain amount of time, you can sell that product in the market, nobody else can. They can sell similar products, but not that specific one. And then it goes generic. And when it goes generic in the United States, the price goes from whatever it is, let's say it's 100, down to about three. And it does that quite quickly because systems like the ones my daddy used to run are designed to make that happen, all right? And so this allows us to then provide a lot more access to patients. And in fact, 85 to 90% of prescriptions dispensed in the United States are generic. All right? So it's, it's a weird system. It's a complicated system. But it leads to a lot of different stakeholders and a lot of layers. And this means it's not as efficient as it could be. All right? And then the other piece of is right now, Unfortunately, it does not reward innovation. So if you bring a product like Kim Raya that I described, the cellular therapy, forward, it will not say that is worth a lot of money because you're saving children. Children will work for many, many years and provide value to society, etc. and it's much better than the current therapy. It's a different model, and I'll explain what we did there. What happens is basically most of the prices are compared to other products that are out there. So if you had product A that's been in the market, product B is a little bit better, product B will be a little bit more, is usually how it works. There's more science to it, and there's techniques that we have to use with economists, but that is not an uncommon approach. What's occurred in the last 10 to 15 years 
is the insurance co-pays and co-insurances have dramatically increased for patients. So before, where maybe you spent $10, $25 as a copay, now that might be a percentage of the cost of the drug, and it might be very significant. And so that's partially because the insurance companies are looking at how they manage their cost and their addressing. Now, there are a lot of opportunities for support programs out there. And I would always encourage anybody to make sure you have gone to the company website and you have understood if there is support there. There are also programs out there run by advocacy groups that try to support patients as well. And there was a study out of Duke um, that said that if people took advantage of the tools and programs that are out there, 79% of those issues would not be there. So please first always see what's available. Now there are also government programs, uh, but there are complexities here. So always try to understand what the systems are because the companies and the scientists who work on this, of course we want to make a profitable business so we can invest in the next level of innovation and we can continue, but we also want to make sure patients get the drugs. So I personally spend a lot of time on this, my team spend a lot of time on this, and we need better programs and systems. So I'm very proud that my former company and I worked on how do you do true outcomes and value-based agreements. And I'll use again that cellular therapy as an example. So remember that we have to take the cells from the patient, engineer them, grow them, expand them, send them back. It costs a lot, a lot of money to do that. We're not good at it yet, okay? we get an 83% response rate. So we went to Medicare and Medicaid, the government, and we agreed that you only pay if you get a response. Okay? And this is, in many cases, what we would like to do, but it's very hard to do, because you have to know that that's the patient. That's the response. The, the payer has to agree that we agree on that. <laughs> okay? And then we have to adjudicate the money. But that's what we'd like to get to. And we need a lot of work as a system to help us get to that environment. So what are the big takeaways? System is complicated. System doesn't really reward the right level of innovation. We all play a role. Physicians, hospitals, insurance, PBMs, pharmaceutical industry, patients. And we need to work together to get to a better sustainable approach. But there are systems, there are information, there are programs, and please use them. Now, the other thing I wanted to close with is clinical trials. Now, I talked to you before about the brave patients and their families who participate in these investigations, because that's what they are. We have a theory, we have data, and we think this mechanism is going to work in this patient better than the current treatment. And we do have to test versus current treatment. Okay? It can't just be a thought. And in that situation, we learn, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But without that, we never make progress, right? So it's really fundamentally important. And right now, only 3 to 5% of patients participate in clinical trials. So there are, you, you saw the numbers about 1.6 million diagnosed every year, and we have 19 million people living with cancer in the United States right now. We can inform the future really, really well if we expand that even by doubling it. So, at the same time, this is not without risk, and I want to be really clear about that. It might not work. It might, not, it might have new side effects. It might be more complex for you. So if you're a patient and you're thinking, should I participate, should I not, what should you consider? Number one, how typical is your disease? If you have a fairly typical prostate cancer, breast cancer, commonly treated disease that doesn't have any really unusual characteristics, then maybe the standard therapy is the best option that you have considering everything else. Okay? Now, you may say, I don't care. I'm going to go for the best innovation. I'm going to take that step and thank you if you do that. Okay? But not everybody is going to make that choice. But that can give you confidence or knowledge as to how the product will go. So, the other piece is, how good are my physicians? 
And, and I mean that related to the disease. If it's, a, again, a common disease that they see a lot of and they have good expertise on and things like that, that can be very comforting because we were talking, some of us earlier, about having the relationship and the trust in your physician, right? And that open communication. And that's really important. But sometimes it's a disease they don't see very much. Okay, that chronic myeloid leukemia I talked about earlier, on average, a physician will have four to five of those patients in their practice. So if you have that disease, I'm probably going to go to a specialist first in that disease, and then I can go back to my physician maybe and have the following, monitoring, et cetera. But they just don't have a lot of experience. And it's not fair to expect them to understand and know everything on 200 diseases. So understanding that where you are. And then the other part is how much is the burden, whether it's how much is covered cost-wise, or how often do I have to go get visited? How often do I have to have a bone marrow biopsy? You know, we have a, a good friend of mine, Amy Baker, who was in some of the early trials for a product called Tacigna. She lived in Ohio, and she traveled to Florida every month for her treatment and her trial. Now, she was willing to do that. Not everybody can. And in many cases now, we have local options. But those are the types of things that you should be talking about to decide whether or not I go in. Okay? Now, big picture, what should you be able to do? Inform, inform, inform. The information is available out there. Have you and the physician and their staff have a, a well-informed conversation, okay? They're trained, and they have all the right intentions. It is your treatment, your life, and it is up to you to take that active role in that case, okay? Next piece is advocate for what you want. They do not know unless you share. Okay, and every patient has different journeys and different choices. Where are they in life? What do they have moments that they're looking forward to? How does this quality of life affect them, et cetera? Make sure you're talking to them, your staff, but you're advocating for what you want and you're clear. The other piece, and this is really important, is use the resources that are available. The physician's office will have a lot of information and tools, websites, brochures, et cetera, staff that can talk to you about care, staff that can talk to you about coverage. But additionally, on the internet, and you do have to screen this, but on the internet, there's a lot that's available. The companies I already spoke to, there are many patient advocacy groups out there that are very passionate about what they do, and they have a lot of good tools and resources and community. You know, I always say it's about education, advocacy, community when you're talking about these people, and being able to share your experiences with others. And lastly, of course, is making sure that you can afford the products and that you take advantage of the tools that are available. So with that, I thank you for your time and attention. I hope it was useful, and we'll open it up for questions and answers. Thanks.